Hello, everybody. Welcome. Thank you very much for joining us, uh, and thanks for sticking around until the last day of KubeCon. We all made it. You know, I hope everyone's had a great one so far, um, and I hope it gets even better with this. Uh, my name is Peter Hunt. I'm a senior software engineer at Red Hat, working primarily on Cryo, um, but also in upstream SIG node and on Run C and Podman and other container-related technologies. Hello, everyone. Hope you've had a great KubeCon so far. My name is Urvashi Munani, and I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat, working in the container space. Um, so mainly working on Podman Builder, but I'm also a Cryo maintainer as well. Uh, so today we're here to talk to you about Cryo's back, all right. Um, essentially, we're going to be giving you a quick intro on Cryo, as well as some updates that's happened in the project since the last time we met. All right, um, so I'm guessing some of you may already know what Cryo is, but for those of us that are new joining us today, um, Cryo is a lightweight daemon that implements the Kubernetes container runtime interface. Um, it's a CRI that helps you to run your containers in production securely uh, with good performance and uh, with stability. Um, so Cryo is compatible with the OCI spec, so it supports all OCI-compatible images, all OCI-compatible container runtimes, and all OCI-compatible um, registries. Um, some of the OCI-compatible container runtimes are RunC, CRun, Kata, GVisor, um, many more out there. Uh, so an overview of what Cryo is responsible for when you're spinning up your containers. Um, so first thing it does, it um, authenticates your uh, images with the OCI registry. It verifies the image um, that you're trying to pull. It actually uses, it can use SigStore now to do that as well. Um, it, once all of that is done, it will go out and pull the image for you if you don't already have it downloaded and it provisions the disk uh, resources so the image can be written and stored on your disk. When it comes to pod, um, it creates the pod level namespaces and delegates all the networking uh, creation to the CNI, which is the Container Networking Interface plugin that we all uh, that is used in Kubernetes. Um, and then for containers, it translates the CRI request that we get from the kubelet. Um, it translates it to an OCI spec so that it can be passed down to the OCI runtime to um, be started up. It uh, monitors and redirects any output of the containers uh, back to the kubelet so the kubelet can get you know, notifications of when the container is up and running, when it's down, what happened. It also trans uh, transfers the logs as well. Um, and it also provisions the disk resources that is needed for that. Um, I already went through that. <laughs> yeah, so why Cryo? Um, so I think one of the biggest things is that Cryo is made specifically for Kubernetes. Um, it only works with Kubernetes. Our focus is Kubernetes. So if you try to plug in Cryo with any other container orchestration tool, it's probably not going to work. We haven't tested it. <laughs> um, but uh, we ensure that we optimize performance of Cryo based on um, any of the Kubernetes features that are coming in. You can also um, enable experimental features with annotations. Uh, so we track uh, upstream Kubernetes very closely. So if we know there's something new that's coming in, we work on trying to get that into Cryo before it may be available in the Kubernetes if it's something that needs to go in the CRI uh, in like a container runtime interface, basically. Uh, and then we rigorously test Cryo. So we have over 1,500 tests running. These include the Cryo test suites, uh, Kubernetes test suites, OpenShift test suites. We also have some Kata tests that are running as well um, with Cryo. So we rigorously test this to ensure that um, whenever Kubernetes has a new release or something is going on, we don't break Kubernetes. Um, one great thing is that Cryo versions walk in lockstep with the Kubernetes versions. So if you're using Kubernetes 1.26, you know that Cryo 1.26 is what will work with it. Um, you don't have to have another, another graph to try and match, oh, Kubernetes 1.26 is that Cryo 4 something, or you know, but it's the same versions. And every time Kubernetes releases, we also release um, at the same time. So we just released 1.27 yesterday? Yeah. Yesterday, yeah. Um, and then we heavily focus on security with Cryo. Um, we ensure that we reduce the attack surface as much as possible. Um, one thing we do is we enable um, less uh, capabilities by default. So if you go and check um, the containers that are running with Cryo, you look at what capabilities enabled, you will see that they are not as extensive as you would probably see with Podman or Docker or any other container runtime. Um, 
Cryo only has functionality for what exactly is needed in a Kubernetes production cluster. Uh, so you can't do builds with Cryo, for example. You can't push an MSU registry because all that is not needed when you're running your workloads in production. Um, and we're quick to adapt uh, to new security knobs. Um, we have read-only mode to run your containers in read-only mode, so minimizing the attack surface, um, SC Linux capabilities, as well as user namespaces. Um, yeah, so the goal is making running containers in production as secure and boring as possible, so you don't have to worry about it. <laughs> Uh, here are some few cryo stats. Um, we have over 4,500 stars on GitHub. Um, we have had over 180 plus releases so far. And um, we have synced up with 18 versions of Kubernetes so far. Um, over 7,500 commits, and we have 100 contributors on our repository right now. As it's an open source project, we're always looking for more contributors. So if you're interested in trying it out and checking us out, please check out our repo, open issues, open PRs. We're always looking for all the help we can get. Um, and we currently have 10 publicly listed adopters. Um, so a few updates that have gone into Cryo since the last two, three uh, releases is um, in 126, we added support for, node resource, for the node resource interface. Um, NRI essentially lets you use plugins to um, carry out certain actions that are outside of the scope of the CRI. Um, I think it kind of started with a focus of for devices, but um, with the collab community collaboration, we're making it such that it's agnostic, so it can be used for different types of resources and not just limited to devices. Um, this is kind of an example of the community in Bloom. Um, we've been working with ContainerD and Cryo and NRI to get all of this done and supported. And we're hoping to replace the CDI with NRI completely in future releases. Um, next one is um, FreeBSD is getting a lot of traction, um, so we are working on adding support for it. Cryo has been mainly Linux based, but um, that doesn't mean that we cannot support FreeBSD when there's demand for that. So we're currently uh, working on it, um, at, on adding support using RunJ uh, on FreeBSD. Um, we have added some initial support to Podman and Conmon. Uh, Conmon is our container monitoring tool. Um, and we're working um, towards Cryo for that. This is all currently very experimental, um, and as I mentioned earlier, community feedback and support is very welcome. Um, Peter will go ahead with a case study now. Thank you. Um, so yeah, so next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about um, some new, other new things that we've been working on, and I've kind of like written a story about how those all kind of tie in to you as a cluster admin using Cryo. Um, and so, Specifically, we're going to be talking about mitigating like machine in the middle attacks uh, and you know some features in Cryo that exist that'll help one do that. So um, imagine, if you will, I'm a cluster admin and I have my very important app running um, somewhere, and I'm worried about supply chain attacks. Those are very you know hot right now. Something people worry about, rightly so. Um, you know, we want our containers in production to be running in the way that we expect them to, and we don't want someone coming in and mucking around with them. So, you know, the, the bad case scenario in this case is, you know, some malicious entity coming in and intercepting, for instance, like the container image poll or, you know, uh, uh, messing with the registry a little bit. And there are some ways to mitigate this, you know, outside of these features that I've talked about, you know, using, um, you know, full image manifest to pull, you know, the digest to pull your image rather than going by tag. That's a very easy way to mitigate it. But, you know, we're not always very diligent about that and it's harder to update images if we don't if we do that, so um, there are some other options that Cryo provides to provide that, uh, some extra security around that. So the first, uh, you know, thing that we can do, so, you know, we have, we're, you know, we're running our cluster and uh, we're worried about these uh, machine in the middle attacks. Um, so the first step would be to catch a, um, a, you know, someone actually trying to do this. So, you know, ideally we'd have some way to be paying attention to the container and have the Kubernetes API alert us when there's some, uh, you know, uh, unexpected processes happening in our containers. And we can do that with uh, SecComp. So libseccomp is an interface that the kernel exposes to allow user space processes to get an idea of what's going on, uh, which this calls processes are calling. Historically, it's been used, um, you know, the kernel will stop, kill a process that uses a syscall that's not allowed within an allowed list. But there are new, in uh, newer kernels, there's also the option to have the kernel notify a user space process 
when a kernel, uh, when a syscall is used outside of the uh, specified list. Uh, and Cryo has uh, recently, as of 126, I believe, added experimental support for leveraging SecCop Notify to uh, allow a user, an end user, to uh, catch a syscall being run inside of uh, their container without, um, you know, and then you know, kill the process, but also let them know. And I'll go over a little bit about how that works. So we start off in Cryo. Cryo is going to be running our container to pull the image, you know, start the pod, and then eventually start the container. Um, so you know, we take this first step and we run the container. The container's running, it's doing its thing, chugging along, um, and suddenly there is a syscall that we don't really expect to be in there. We have our list of syscalls that we expect our container to be using, and suddenly some malicious user was able to access you know, the container and use a syscall that wasn't in that list. So when that happens, um, the, kernel, the container attempts to you know, call the syscall, and that goes up to the kernel, and then the kernel catches that and notifies Cryo and tells, hey, Cryo, like your container just used something that you weren't expecting. Cryo will then stop the container uh, and then emit an event both to the Kubernetes API as well as a metric to Prometheus. So here we have a couple of uh, ways that we, you know, the, a couple of configurations that we need to set this up. So on the top left here, we have, uh, you know, the seccomp, um, the seccom profile that will be used. So we allow these couple of uh, syscalls, but we don't do anything else. Um, we don't allow anything else. And then uh, we also, in the crowd configuration, we uh, have the default runtime, run C, have an allowed annotation that says seccomp notifier action. Uh, and then in the pod spec, what we do is when we set the seccomp notifier action to stop, uh, Cryo will do all the internal pl plumbing to set up a uh, routine inside of Cryo that's listening to the kernel uh, for any uh, notification actions that happen. And when uh, that container does use one of those actions, as we saw over here, that uh, watcher routine will catch that action and then respond to it. And then here we have the, what the uh, different events look like in, you know, that are emitted from Cryo. So the first thing is Cryo will emit a, uh, you know, the reason that it terminated the container, it'll say seccomp killed, and it'll actually say the use syscalls that the reason that it was killed, and it'll actually wait a couple of moments uh, before stopping the container to allow the container to, you know, use a couple extra ones so that we catch all of them. And this is, you know, it's possible in this case that the uh, action, the, the syscalls that were caught, we actually do expect, and it's possible that, you know, maybe this was just an issue with the seccomp profile. But, you know, so we attempt to collect for a little bit longer just to allow, you know, that container to use all of them so we're not like doing a crash uh, loop back off situation. But, um, you know, uh, eventually, Either the action would be to update the SecCon profile because those syscalls are expected, or we'll want to do a little bit of diagnostics on what actually happened, like why this container was using the syscalls that we don't expect. And for this, we can uh, move towards our uh, next feature, uh, which is uh, Checkpoint Restore. So in Kubernetes, Checkpoint Restore uh, support has been added in Alpha in 125 in Cryo. Uh, has added support for it as well um, within the alpha feature. Uh, Checkpoint Restore, uh, there's a program, uh, CryU, which is very confusing uh, for some people, uh, myself included when I began. And but CryU stands for Checkpoint Restore in User Space as opposed to CryO, which is the Container Runtime Interface, OCI. Um, the, uh, using CryU, uh, the Kubernetes stack is able to uh, take requests now for to checkpoint a container, a running container, and you know then an admin can inspect that uh, checkpointed container, run it somewhere else, maybe restore it on another node where it's a little more sandboxed, or maybe just you know poke around the checkpointed uh, blob and see what's going on, like what the container was up to, maybe uh, you know catch some additional issues with it, um, and then hopefully be able to then quickly fix that in production. Um, the fact that it was checkpointed will be hidden from the original container, so if there's a malicious actor doing something, you know, they may not necessarily know that the container is being checkpointed, uh, which will, you know, allow, uh, you know, someone to respond uh, quickly, but also uh, efficiently. And um, it, the, eventually a container could be restored to another cryo environment or back into production node. 
So the, as I mentioned, the uh, feature is currently in alpha state and we're looking for feedback on the user interface as well as we're working with uh, co the ContainerD community to come with a uh, unified format for the image, uh, the checkpointed blob so that eventually you could even checkpoint on one and restore on another perhaps. Um, so uh, here we have the uh, the user interface, so it's pretty simple, though it's kind of convoluted right now because it's not, uh, you know, once we get to beta or graduation, the user interface will be better, we'll be able to, you know, ping through the Kubernetes API server. But for now, you just have to directly uh, make a request to the kubelet, so you have to know, so here we have this uh, at the top, the URL that you would, um, you know, request. And so the first part of that local host, that's just like the name of the, uh, the server, you know, the URL of the server where the kubelet is running, where you want to checkpoint this container. And then um, the, you hit the checkpoint endpoint, uh, and that's in the default namespace. And then counters would be the name of the pod, and then counter is the name of the specific container. Right now, you're just able to checkpoint a single container. And maybe one day we would extend that to be able to checkpoint a whole pod um, if this feature was extended to something like, you know, live migration or something like that. Uh, and then the way that you restore it is you just, you know, you create a, uh, so th this here is a CRI uh, JSON blob. Um, if you've ever used CryCuddle, then you'll be aware of kind of what this looks like. So this is the way to create a container with CryCuddle. So you would maybe run this uh, outside of a Kubernetes environment, but while running Cryo and use CryCuddle to actually, uh, you know, restore that container and inspect what's going on in it. So the key things here is you just have to give it a name because all the objects need one. And then um, for the image, instead of specifying, you know, an like a, an OCI image path that would maybe be pulled from a registry, you specify a path to the checkpoint archive and then Cryo will under the hood interpret like that checkpoint archive and be like, oh, this isn't an image. I don't need to pull anything. I just need to restore this container. So Cryo could do that and you could poke around inside of it or see what's going on in an isolated place and maybe be able to, uh, you know, catch a malicious actor who's, uh, you know, in intercepted your container or your uh, image running. So we've done our investigation. We mitigate the issue. We find, okay, you know, there was someone we, you know, fixed, you know, the uh, permissions on things or, you know, we managed to uh, migrate something so that uh, it, this isn't, uh, you know, we, we've settled the incident, but now we want to look forward and ask ourselves, like, what can we do to prevent this in the future, you know, in a retrospective kind of way? And uh, a great way to do that is to uh, use uh, signed images to be able to verify that an image that you're pulling and running is the one that you expect it to be. Um, and for that, we would like to recommend SigStore. So SigStore has been a hot project for you know a year or two now, and um, Cryo has uh, support for uh, verifying with uh, si signatures uh, using SigStore. So we've always had, or for a long time, had the ability to verify with signatures in general. But uh, recently, as of Cryo uh, 126, we all, or 127, we also have the option of verifying signatures in like a ReCore or a full CO um, store. So, uh, you know, an admin could, after, you know, handling this whole instance, incident, uh, begin signing their images. And so whenever Cryo attempted to pull an image, it would need to also verify that image against like a ReCore uh, log and uh, to make sure that, or, you know, and maybe they'll be signed by full CO, uh, a CA and full CO. And so the uh, idea is that um, the, we can use keyless signing, you don't really have to be managing GPT um, signatures and the like. We can have an easy user interface and that's all integrated into Cryo. And Podman uh, semi-recently uh, also has support for pushing images with signatures. So if you want a complete stack solution, you can use Cryo and Podman together to sign your images and push them to the registry and then Cryo can uh, verify those there. And so with that, we have kind of a complete stack of, you know, experimental features, but a lot of features that we're looking forward to kind of uh, moving further along and uh, developing that can help a, a admin, you know, manage the, uh, uh, manage different, um, you know, levels of attacks on the stack uh, to uh, mitigate uh, malicious users. So we actually, uh, that we went quite quickly, and uh, that is the content that we have. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, we have a number of 
um, links here and we'll post this on Sketch as well so that you can access them directly. Um, I would like to take any questions uh, if you have any and I'll leave this up for a little bit and then I'll move to the um, QR code for any feedback that you have. But uh, do we have any questions in the audience now? One over here. I would like to ask one question about checkpointing. So you're talking about from security perspective, but what is the plans maybe for integrating it as a job control, like suspending pods and just resuming without any security impact, but for like preemption kind of things? Totally. So that's definitely on our radar. As uh, many uh, Kubernetes contributors know in this room, the process of getting a feature into Kubernetes is sometimes a slow one because we try to be very deliberate about you know, making sure all of the pieces work together. Um, so uh, the main uh, engineer who's been working on this, Adrian, opted to go for like a step-by-step -step approach of getting Checkpoint Restore into Kubernetes. So this is the first step. The first step is just, you know, we have the API between Kubelet and Cryo. Eventually, maybe we'll have one between the API server to allow for the checkpointing um, to happen. You know, and then in the, you know, between the CRI implementations, we're gonna be negotiating what the, uh, you know, actual restored, you know, artifact could be, um, which will make it easier to pass along that archive uh, you know, to different places. Eventually, I think it is within, uh, you know, on our radar and in the scope of what we're imagining, it would be cool to be able to do like a live migration thing, but we're taking it, you know, deliberately and slowly, slowly to make sure that it's stable across the uh, stack. There's a lot of pieces that kind of need to be moved together. But um, definitely, if you look at um, KEP2008, uh, which was listed on the slide earlier, um, if you leave your feedback in the enhancement itself, uh, you know, that this is something on your radar, this will help the Kubernetes, you know, contributors uh, prioritize the work that's important for you. So if you have, you know, a specific use case you have in mind, we'd definitely like to hear that. Thank you. We have another one over there. Hi there. So uh, I wonder about the event emitting part. Uh, if there will be any mechanism implemented to prevent uh, the amount of events emitted, like the huge amount of, if, of events uh, emitted by the Sryo. Uh, sorry, can you reword that a little bit? Yeah, like uh, there is a possibility to uh, emit a lot of events, a lot of syscalls from the container, and uh, emitting that uh, huge amount of events could block potentially Prometheus or some other services. And since uh, the resource management is being done on container level, the, uh, well, the runtime could, uh, well, it's a part of the uh, resource management. So it could be a lot of, uh, you know, overhead while emitting the events. So how to deal with that if, or if there will be any mechanism to protect uh, the node from dying by emitting a lot of events. Right, so yeah, the, the overhead for uh, you know, doing the SecCob notify pieces will be charged to the system, so it'll kind of need to be calculated into the system reserve that the Kubelet and Cryo end up using. Um, something that an admin could do to mitigate that is choose the uh, containers that they want to uh, you know, have these events emitted for. So you know, this is an annotation that you have to specifically opt into. So if there are containers on your system that you're not worried about as much or you've already done this testing or you know, you're using SigStore to verify the signatures on those images, if they're more verified, then um, you can uh, reduce the um, number of containers that could hit this. We kind of consider this situation, like using a syscall outside of the list of syscalls to be an abnormal situation. So we, in designing this, uh, did um, assume that there would be an amount of overhead for that because, uh, you know, the, this, we think that emitting the event and the uh, metric will help developers of, you know, or cluster admins catch this situation. And for the containers that they opt into it, I think that value proposition will end up being worth it. But um, definitely, you know, reducing the set of containers will reduce the overhead. Um, and it's just kind of a trade off of like, you know, do you want this, you know, feature for enhanced security or do you want, you know, slightly better performance? The other aspect to mention is, you know, the number of events that will go through um, will depend on the restart behavior of the pod. So we'll only emit one event for that specific container. Um, 
because it'll be terminated, so like that termination will be caught if that container doesn't have a restart policy always um, or on failure. Then uh, you know if if you have a restart policy never, then you could you know do your investigation and then catch all try to uh, expand the you know, seccom profile or you know mitigate the attack and then um, and then eventually you know there will be fewer events. So the the idea is that this is kind of a later step. You would have ideally already kind of figured out your seccom profile for your container, so this won't be happening a whole lot. It'll just kind of be, you know, for these special containers that you're kind of worried about, maybe in a multi-tenant environment, uh, or, you know, just ones that are very critical, and so the, the scope is a little bit smaller. Thank you. Um, do we have any other questions? Sure, yes, so we have uh, the feedback here, and um, yes, thank you for everyone for joining, and uh, I hope you enjoy the rest of your KubeCon, and safe travels home. Thank you all. Thanks.